my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Matthew Ellis from the Baylor College, Houston. Heterogeneity in treatment response in patients with luminal breast cancer. Prediction of response. Hello, everybody. Nice to be with you today. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, really some fundamental work on the causes of variable response to endocrine therapy in ER positive breast cancer uh, and come to an interesting conclusion about what the fundamental causes of this disease may be. Um, here's my conflicts of interest. I put this slide only up uh, 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 only because um, uh, this actually happened to me when I was a clinical fellow, when I was, I was, I was, I was talking to the, uh, uh, the MD-PhD students at Baylor, and I reminded them that uh, you, in, during the course of your career, you'll meet many brilliant basic scientists that are a lot more clever than you are, uh, but you really is uh, the person who studies patients and has access to outcomes and tissues have, an uh, have a unique scientific opportunity, which I think I'll try and illustrate to you today. Now, um, obviously we've been studying luminal breast cancer for many years, and we all know how incredibly variable the outcomes are. It's a very strange disease, actually, because we start uh, adjuvant endocrine therapy, um, and we look at the relapse patterns, uh, and the latest data would suggest you're just as likely to relapse at year three as you are at year 20. So there's some intrinsic basic clock that's driving resistance in a very consistent manner. Um, and I'm going to be talking to you uh, about what that mechanism might be. Now, one of the ways that we've been studying this is to give uh, endocrine drugs before surgery, because that gives you an opportunity to decide uh, whether a tumor is endocrine therapy responsive or resistant. Um, in that you get a nice uh, suppression of proliferation in the sensitive tumors and some degree of, uh, of, of resistance uh, to cell cycle arrest in the resistant poor outcome tumors. But what's fundamentally uh, underlying this variability in cell cycle response? Now you have to hit that. Um, so here's a, a study that's relatively mature and we have outcomes on uh, this, the ACOSOG Z1031 trial, which compared three aromatase inhibitors before surgery um, uh, and obviously got uh, serial uh, biopsy material on this uh, study. Uh, and and uh, basically, uh, the long-term outcomes, or I'd say intermediate-term outcome, the sort of five-year outcome data on this trial, will suggest there's a subset of patients who do incredibly well, as marked by the fact that they have complete obliteration of the proliferation of the tumor with the aromatase inhibitor with key 67 levels that are basically at zero or close to zero, and they have relatively low uh, surgical stage, uh, versus uh, these unfortunate patients who have some degree of slippage, if you like, in the relationship between uh, the estrogen receptor and the cell cycle uh, uh, mechanism, in that despite very profound estrogen deprivation, the tumor is still able to proliferate. So what's the cause of this estrogen-independent proliferation that's driving those poor outcomes? Well, one approach we took uh, several years ago was to do whole genome sequencing and look at the uh, relationships uh, between aromatase inhibitor sensitive genomes and aromatase inhibitor uh, resistant genomes. And um, of course, when we first started to do this kind of experiment, we were hoping there would be some magical mutation that would explain this resistance. But really what I got uh, from this uh, analysis is something uh, slightly different and I think fairly profound which is that the aromatase inhibitor uh, resistant tumors had much more complicated genomes. But not just one type of somatic mutations, all sorts of different types of somatic mutations were elevated in the resistant tumors. Um, but you can see here from the sort of the, the, the illegible annotation on the outside of the ring, particularly a lot of uh, point mutations. So there's a higher point mutation rate in the resistant tumors uh, versus the sensitive one, as well as also increase in chromosomal rearrangements. But it's particularly those point mutations that got me interested. Now, one thing you can do with point mutations is do clonality analysis. 
because some of those point mutations are relatively rare in the tumor and some of them are quite common in these tumors where you're sort of grinding them up and, and, and sequencing everything. And, and the frequency of those mutations that tell you whether that's a subclonal mutation or a clonal mutation present in, in most, if not all, of the tumor cells. And you can do this sort of clonal analysis. Uh, and and one, of the, uh, one of the things that uh, we demonstrated by looking at whole genomes before treatment and at the end of treatment, there was a lot of clonal dynamism. In other words, there's many different subclones within a tumor, and when you treat them, the relationships between those, sub those subclones uh, ch changes. Uh, this is actually the most uh, dramatic example. This was an ER-positive tumor here, and um, at the end of treatment, it actually become ER-negative and highly proliferative. And that's because there's actually two clonally independent tumors that are grown into each other, one ER positive, one ER negative. The ER positive one goes away, and at surgery, you just got the ER negative one, which you sequenced, and it had a completely different genome. This is implying that actually two separate tumors. So a lot of complexity here. Other tumors, uh, you can see a different sort of pattern. Uh, this is the post-treatment variance, and this is the pre-treatment variance, and you've got two different um, uh, post-treatment biopsies, and you can see that the patterns are different. Um, for example, this pink clone is, very con uh, uh, is, is a new clone in the post-treatment sample, not present in the pre-treatment sample, and, and, but um, very rare in one biopsy and very common in the other. So what's driving all this crazy heterogeneity and diversity? There must be something uh, more than meets the eye. So we started thinking about the fact there must be DNA repair defects in ER-positive breast cancers that are a little bit different to the kinds of DNA repair defects that we talk about commonly in breast cancer, that is to say, homologous recombination de uh, defects and BRCA1 and BRCA2. There are all these other forms of DNA repair that we started to sort of try to do unbiased analysis of to see if any of them were related to endocrine therapy resistance and uh, high mutational loads. And in this paper published uh, last year, uh, we alighted on one particular mechanism of uh, resistance and um, high mutation burden. That is to say, loss of the mute L class of DNA repair uh, enzyme. So the genesis of this experiment is we looked at the wonderful uh, Metabric data, and, and I think um, Carlos Caldas and Sam Aparito need huge amount of credit for creating this amazing database where they did uh, genomics on large numbers of cases and, and put it into the public database, and we were beginning to sort of search through these things. Uh, essentially, in this experiment, looking for loss of expression of certain DNA repair uh, enzymes and its relationship to overall survival in ER positive breast cancer. And what we found was something very curious. It was the mute L components, MLH1, PMS1, and PMS2, that are associated with poor overall survival in Metabric, but not the mute S components. So something very specific about mute L loss. So then we do a simple experiment indicated here where we just knock down one component, the MLH1 gene from MCF7 cells, and what you see here is instant endocrine therapy resistance to all classes of endocrine drug. If, you don't, if the tumor doesn't have mute L, it can't respond to endocrine therapy. And so you can do further simple experiments, and you can see once again with your powerful anti-endocrine drug for Vestrant, which completely degrades the estrogen receptor in this experiment, you can see that it inhibits uh, the controls, Fulvestrant nicely inhibits, whereas in the MLH1, it doesn't inhibit. But interestingly, they remain sensitive to a CDK4-6 inhibitor. So you got this, so just loss of one DNA repair enzyme creates this very interesting phenotype of endocrine therapy resistance, but with persistent sensitivity to a CDK4-6 inhibitor. And I'm not going to go through all the details of this paper, but I just want to point out this working model here. So the working model uh, obviously relates to the fact that the uh, DNA repair enzymes talk to the cell cycle. Of course they do, because the cell doesn't want to replicate a damaged genome. So if there's DNA damage, it holds the cell cycle machinery in check so that the repair can take place so that you then do a faithful replication of a repaired genome, 
not an unrepaired genome, which would obviously be pretty bad for the cell. And it turns out that this pathway that mute L is on, that's speaking to CDK4-6, does so through ATM and CHECK2, and it turns out the way endocrine therapy works to arrest the cell cycle is through ATM. So they're related. And without going through all this complicated molecular biology, what we're actually showing here is if you knock down ATM or you knock down CHECK2, uh, you generate these endocrine therapy resistant phenotypes. And you can do that with knockdowns or you can do that with drugs. And it's specific to ATM because an ATR inhibitor doesn't generate endocrine therapy resistance. Of course, it also shows that you shouldn't toy with the idea of using CDK4-6. Sorry, you shouldn't you toy with the idea of using ATM inhibitors or CHECK2 inhibitors in the context of endocrine therapy because you'll actually kill the endocrine therapy efficacy. So, but basically, I think we're, we were thought we were onto something here. So, but we needed some, something more than just clever in vitro experiments. So we went to this study that I did with the team at WashU and Cynthia Ma, the neo Palana trial, which was one of the first trials to look at neoadjuvant um, CDK4-6 inhibition. This is actually pretty early on in the days of CDK4-6 inhibitors. And we did this sequential biopsy study where patients started uh, with anastrozole and then after one month we added in the palpocyclib and then after uh, 15 days we did a third biopsy. So we have baseline, post-AI and post-AI and the combination with palpocyclib. And then we obviously did whole genome sequencing and then we looked, got these uh, mutational phenotypes. And you can see here on the left um, that the MSH mutant alleles are all sensitive to endocrine therapy and palbociclib was doing very little for them. Whereas these MLH mutants, there's obviously very few of them and all this needs to be further validated. I'm just being provocative with this experiment. But you can see here this MLH3 or this MLH1 mutant, really essentially no response to the induction treatment with aromatase inhibitor, but exquisitely sensitive to CDK4-6 inhibitors. So, somewhat intriguing. Uh, and the last piece of evidence here that says these things are related is this WIM20 cell line, which turns out to be PMS1 uh, defective, has a completely crazy genome, but nonetheless it's sensitive to palbociclib. But if you keep treating this model, acquired resistance to palbociclib occurs, and we're just resequencing those, but I suspect we'll find the classic palbociclib resistance mutations like RB. So is this just a mute L phenomenon? Because there's lots of single strand break repair mechanisms in the cell. So we went on to use a similar kind of technique to ask, is it just a story about mute L? And we know that, you know, there isn't a strong relationship between having germline mismatch repair defects in breast cancer, but there is some relationship and it's said to be mostly for mute L genes. So we're sort of interested in that. But what about other single cell break repair mechanisms. And so uh, it's a similar kind of approach to what I've just shown you. We're relating DNA uh, repair gene expression to key 67 uh, changes. We're looking for mutations and expression of genes in other data sets and coming up um, with uh, additional candidates. And in the Metabric analysis, we came up with SENTN2, uh, driving poor outcomes when, low, when expressed at low levels, ERCC1, and NEL2. Now SENT N2 and ERCC1, uh, they repair complicated single strand uh, damage um, through stabilization or the function of the xeroderma pigmentosa complex. And NEL2 is a much uh, simpler uh, base excision repair uh, enzyme. But nonetheless, uh, these, as you can see from these Kaplan-Meier curves, when there's a tumor that has low expression of these genes, uh, they're tending to do worse. And it turns out they have the same phenotype as MLH1 knockdown. That is to say, when you lose SENTN2 or NEL2 or ERCC1 in an in vitro experiment, they become resistant to tamoxifen and other endocrine drugs. And over on the right, uh, without going through all the details here, they're, all, uh, sensitive, they're resistant to fulvestrant, but they remain sensitive to CDK4-6 inhibition. So, these, so loss of these enzymes actually turns out to explain several things. Hormone independent growth that's sensitive to CDK4-6 inhibitors, but also the relationship between poor outcome and high mutational load. And so here's the sort of working model. 
is that as the cell cycle progresses, there's a whole bunch of enzymes involved in single strand uh, 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 damage which gets repaired and as it's repairing, it's signaling forward to the RB mechanism to restrain it so the repair can be complete. But if you lose those, uh, 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 the function of these enzymes, it's allowing slippage uh, of the cell cycle uh, despite uh, estrogen deprivation, it's allowing that slippage uh, and allowing CDK4-6 uh, activation uh, to promote the cell cycle because the lack of the feedback control, um, uh, but that of course can be inhibited uh, with a CDK4-6 inhibitor. So uh, to just uh, alight on uh, several further things and then make a conclusion, uh, as part of our effort to find more mutations uh, that relate to poor outcome, uh, we've been doing these large-scale sequencing experiments. This is a collaboration with Obi Griffiths at WashU and Torsten Nielsen at the University of British Columbia and Elaine Mardis and myself, uh, where we sequenced 83 genes. This was whole exome sequencing for 83 genes out of paraffin-embedded material in, in samples where we had long-term outcome. And what you can see here, without going through all the details, is a series of forest plots that relate to uh, individual mutations. And over on the right, patients are doing worse. And over on the left, they're doing better. And it shows some expected relationships, like PIK3CA mutations associated with better prognosis, uh, PIK3CA mutations associated with better prognosis, P53 with worse uh, prognosis. But in, in, uh, something new on the block were these NF1 mutations frame shift nonsense mutations, not that common, but associated with poor outcome. And interestingly, again, working with the Metabric group, uh, we were able to, uh, Metabric database rather, we were able to confirm that frame shift nonsense mutations in NF1 are associated with poor outcomes, which is really interesting. Because if you think about NF1, NF1 germline mutations get an elevated risk of breast cancer about three to fourfold. In fact, I don't know if anyone's treated an NF1 patient, uh, a neurofibromatosis patient with breast cancer, but they all get locally advanced breast cancer because all those neurofibromas on the skin of the breast means that the cancer doesn't get diagnosed uh, readily. So uh, this is a little bit of unpublished data. Uh, so I, 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 in, in, with respect to the people I'm working with, uh, Eric Chang, I won't go into uh, a lot of details, but this session is about response to endocrine therapy. I'll just show you this interesting experiment where knocking down NF1 um, actually causes tamoxifen agonism. So if you have an NF1 patient, so, uh, it, it, theoretically at least, giving them tamoxifen is exactly the wrong drug to give them. It may actually promote their, out, their, their poor outcomes. Um, they get extremely sensitive to estradiol, shifts the dose response rate uh, to estradiol enormously without NF1, which is a very interesting phenotype. But they remain sensitive to fulvestrin. You can see, actually, if anything, they're slightly more sensitive to fulvestrin. So you've got some evidence of a gene when lost, it's creating differential endocrine responses of the type we actually see in patients. Of course, it's a long road from there to proving that in patients, but we're trying hard. Finally, I just want to tell you a little bit about uh, estrogen receptor gene fusions, because this might not be in everybody's uh, thinking uh, process, but I think that the, um, uh, this, this, this particular endocrine therapy resistance variant is, is, is marching towards clinical significance. Um, so we first uh, found one of these estrogen receptor gene fusions in one of our PDXs, this unfortunate patient, uh, sort of not an uh, infrequent story of being diagnosed with stage 4 disease, so de novo stage 4 disease in this patient, gets her through endocrine drugs, has a pretty lousy response. She comes to me for a second opinion, we make a PDX, we go on to treat her with various drugs and she doesn't do well. The PDX you can see here is completely resistant to estrogen deprivation, completely de resistant uh, to fulvestrant. And we found in this tumor by RNA sequencing and whole genome sequencing, this aberrant protein here that's actually a fusion gene between estrogen receptor and the hippocoactivator YAP1 in frame, creating a brand new transcription factor. And we've recently studied these in great depth, they were recently published in cell reports. But the very interesting thing about these fusions, they actually drive metastasis. So when we all treat these ER-positive breast cancers, isn't it interesting, you have bone-only disease, you give them your favorite endocrine drug, and then when they recur, suddenly they've got liver mets. I don't know if you all had this experience, right? Well, what drives that progression? Well, one possibility, these ESR1 fusions, because in these experiments, you can see that the fusions drive uh, uh, liver, uh, sorry, a lung metastasis in this experimental model, and they drive EMT. 
And as we collaborate with our friends around the world, uh, you can see that we're getting increasingly numbers of these in-frame mutations. They all have in-frame fusions. They all have the same mechanism where they, it's up to uh, exon 6 of ESR1 preserving the DNA binding domain and the hinge domain. Um, uh, and actually it's exon 6, but it's exon 4 for the coding uh, region exons. And then they fuse in-frame to a great variety of different genes, which turns out that they have s some similarities in their transcriptional activity and some differences which I won't go into. But the bottom line is, right now the only way to diagnose these things is with unbiased RNA-seq, uh, followed by a validation experiment. Uh, but as we get more RNA-seq data from metastatic patients, I think this is one of the things to look for. So in conclusion, um, I think the cause of death from ER positive breast cancer is genomic complexity, and this is due to a myriad of single-strand bait repair defects which drive adaption, evolution, and drug resistance, and disconnect the uh, regulation of the cell cycle um, by estrogen receptor from the CDK46RB mechanism. Of course, they can be rescued with CDK46 inhibitor, but of course, the CDK46 inhibition itself is limited by adaptive evolution and resistance. There's so many variants in these tumors, it's inevitable that a variant will emerge that's resistant. I have, however, shown you that specific mutations are also important, including frameshift nonsense mutations in NF1, and more of that perhaps in two years when we've published this data. Uh, but that actually may also alter the profile of response to estrogen deprivation versus CERN versus SIRDS. I've talked to you about exon 6 um, fusions, which are driving metastasis. So endocrine therapy resistance is intrinsically related to the lethality of the tumor and its ability to metastasize around the body. What's the answer to all this? Well, I, I think because poor outcome breast cancer is related to DNA repair defects and mutational load and presumably neoantigen generation, we have to work hard, I think, in the immunotherapy area um, as, I, as, as the only, uh, I think, uh, solution to this problem that comes at least to my mind today. Thanks very much for listening to me. Um, I'll talk, I just want to point out, Svasi Haricharan, Jonathan Lay, and Minakshi uh, Anurag, who uh, are the geniuses behind much of this data, and my funders. Thanks very much. So I, I have one question for you. Really fascinating, this presentation. Uh, recently, in a, in a paper published by the group of Andrew Tat, there is a clear evidence that ERCC1 null triple negative breast cancer increase uh, the upregulation of a uh, gene signatures related to STING, so may predict potential response to immune checkpoint inhibitors. And your last sentence summarizes all the presentation you did. So in order to select these ER positive patients, potentially responsive to immune checkpoint inhibitors, which is specifically your algorithm? Should we treat everyone or should we select the ones with MLH loss or ERCC1 loss? Well, that's a great question. And uh, we're working very hard on that. Uh, and we have some manuscripts in, in, in preparation. Um, the bottom line is there are ER positive tumors that are inflamed and they have TILs and they are predominant luminal B, and they are higher grade. And so I think there's a place to start, and we're actually uh, discussing neoadjuvant studies in high genomic risk, high stage, ER-positive breast cancer with immune checkpoint inhibitors in randomized trials in the neoadjuvant setting, and hopefully they'll see light of day. There's certainly one already happening with pembrolizumab, I believe. So the field's already moving in that direction. Of course, the big thing with ER-positive breast cancer is to how, how to make a, uh, a, a, an immunologically cold tumor hot, and I think that's going to be a, a, a very important field for the future. Um, but there's all sorts of complexity here. I was just talking to Shireen, and we're looking at some data together. But a lot of ER-positive tumors make mucin, and mucin actually creates an immune barrier, uh, which we might need to address. Uh, as lots of other things that uh, we need to discuss. But it's quite possible that some of these, as you're pointing out, uh, DNA repair defect signatures might be important selection criteria. Yes, microphone six. Thank you for this great talk. Um, you nicely demonstrated that um, the loss of uh, the estrogen receptor resulted in, or was due to a second clone, an ear negative second clone in the tumor. 
which of course survived the endocrine therapy. Can we break it down that if the ear positivity is very high, that the risk or the chance for a second clone, a ear negative clone, is low? And if the ear positivity is low, middle to low, that the risk for a second clone in this tumor is high? And even further, if you do, do neoadjuvant endocrine therapy and you have not a good PEPI score outcome or not a good loss of um, uh, 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 turnover frequency, that, um, and the ear positivity stays the same, you have a primary endocrine resistance. And if you have a loss of the or reduction of the ear positivity after endocrine therapy, there's a high risk or there is a second clone. Okay, well the first thing I say is come and have a cup of coffee with me, that's about five, eight questions. Uh, and, and, but they're all fabulous questions. The one thing we did find with the PEPI score is the e losing ER expression was associated independently with very poor outcome. In our whole genome sequencing experiment, of course, we didn't do huge numbers, I, what was it, about 57 or something, and we only found one that was eg egregiously obvious as that. Um, so I don't think that being an, an ER negative tumor lost with an ER positive tumor is that common an, an event, but uh, certainly an interesting thing. Um, and I'll leave it at that, but uh, come find me afterwards. Last question, microphone two. Yes, Florian Fitzel from Vienna. Um, do you think when we use the wrong treatment in neoadjuvant uh, therapy for luminal breast cancer patients and we select a clone which is more aggressive than we saw it in biopsy, do you think we might do harm to the patient? Um, you're certainly seeing something that's harmful, but I'd suggest to you that, you know, no one dies of breast cancer in the breast. Uh, that's, that's a clone that's probably evolving and disseminating and populating organs outside of the breast. So now you know about it, but I don't think the treatment um, is necessarily likely to be harmful in that you selected for it in the breast. I think it's, you, you know about it now, and maybe you could target it in a way that you couldn't before because you didn't know about it. Does that make sense? But um, I had the same thought, you know, that there's obviously a large number of cells you are treating. Is there a unique clone that you select which then subsequently disseminates? I don't know. Okay, thank you, Matthew. Thank you.